40 years ago, we set out into an uncertain future. We didn't know what lay ahead, but we determined to survive and to build a better future for ourselves. In four decades, we've succeeded beyond anybody's imagination. This is my city. This is my country. I carry her people, her lifeblood. I carry them up and down her arteries. As I drive through her streets, I see many things. Perfect roads, her tall buildings, her shiny new cars. We didn't always have these things. There was a time when we were just part of a globe-spanning empire. There was a time when we were an outcast state of a larger federation. There was a time when we were a newborn nation with only her people to turn to. But through all those times and these, we have always had something. Something that gave strength to our identity. Malakawa could hit him with at this corner. Yes! Oh, beautifully taken. What a call by Fandi Ahmad. Came down with a bout of flu midweek, Bohan Abu Sama, but recovered just in time. He has, and the wonderful goal for Singapore. Retail the rest, and he scored! Whoa! Silverwatch is waiting, so is Nasri. Abbas Yaris! Go! And the man who says that he hasn't won it for Singapore before. It's celebrations all around for Singaporeans as the Lions win the Malaysia Cup after 14 years. Demolishing Pahang by four goals to nil. What a result. Finally, 14 years. 14 years of waiting, finally over. Once the four pillars shines the light on the field, that's the fighting ground, man. That's the gladiator's pitch, man. Get a seat, sit down, and just watch. You know what I mean? It's like a Sunday outing or Saturday outing. So we'll all go early. That time we had to go early, because you know, although we got a ticket, uh, pack. Sometimes with a ticket, you can't go in. So we go early. If the game is normally what seven o'clock that time, huh? Yeah, seven or seven thirty. We have to be there by about four thirty. Then when the uh, game starts, the crowd that sat with us accepted us. 
there's nothing like, you know, being in a stadium, 50,000 people together and you're my friend, you're my friend. Everywhere you go is your friend, you know, you're Singapore. Yeah. So it's like bringing the people together again, all races. It's one of the great sort of um, um, melders of uh, different social classes, different racial groups. Yeah, I mean, it really, you hear a lot of people talking about it again and again. In the 70s, nobody paid attention to, to race or um, economic uh, income difference, yeah, social difference. They were just so caught up in uh, how the boys were doing. Everybody was Singaporean for one night. And besides you, uh, 9 out of 10 times or 10 out of time, 10 times, they will be your friends. You will just, you know, high five with the people in front and the, the back, you know. Yeah, even hug each other, you know, as if, you know, uh, that kind of feeling. Lah. Then there's this um, rivalry among the spectators themselves. Uh, where one camp was the Malaysians and one camp was the Singaporeans. And yeah. like, go back, go back, go back, go fry bananas or whatever. It was not a carnival atmosphere. It was mixed with pride. It was mixed with enthusiasm. It was mixed with passion. At that time, we were playing against uh, Malaysian states. So that is that national cry there. That is a rallying point there, you know what I mean? So it was a rallying point for the people. That, that kind of that, that nationalism is there. So whenever even you play against police, it means you're playing against Malaysia. But coming back to the uh, Kalang wave or Kalang roar, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's just like uh, mag magnetism. A kind of understanding, uh, subtle understanding of the person sitting on your left and right, he may be a total stranger but it showed an understanding to stand up and be timely together. The crowd I, actually speaks as one without having to have any rehearsals, you know, without no, no, no guides or something, and it's like spontaneous. It was somebody said, now is the time to do it. That section of the stadium will say one, two, three, and among themselves, not with a mic, for the whole stadium to hear, so orchestrated. This was natural. Yeah, somebody in the crowd will just stand up, five, ten people, and then he just picked up, and then he went round and round and round on its own. It was like camaraderie, and you know, everybody was like red, you know, red, a sea of red, you know, was was electrifying. A spirit of people coming together who were willing to forgo everything else, leave all their problems and their differences outside of the stadium, and be one and united, and make sure that everything went clockwork. It just makes you feel motivated and makes you feel. Even sometimes, you know, you, don't, you get ghost pimples. <laughs> you know, you just feel great, you know, just hearing them cheering and, and doing the Kalang waves. People, have, people outside the country talk about it. They see us doing the, the Kalang wave, they hear the roar, they hear the trampling on the terraces, and they say, oh, it is, must be really intimidating for an opponent and even for the referee when he comes to your home stadium. In those days, it was about the aftermath of our being expelled, so to speak, from Malaysia and that rivalry, that keen, intense rivalry. And Singapore could see itself as, you know, uh, battling against a, a, a more powerful uh, older brother, if you like, but still older and, and more powerful rival, yeah? Uh, since then, we've moved on. It's, the world has become so global, so complicated. It's hard to, for Singapore to see itself as being merely the younger brother fighting against the older brother anymore. To, to most Singaporeans, that's so, you know, past, so passe, that the kind of simple, allegiance, you know, there's Dola Kasim kissing the national flag and I as a Singaporean spectator attach my own, invest my own feelings in that because we are against the traditional rivals. That is just, you know, it no, no longer seems as concentrated and as pure a feeling in the, the complicated society that we live in today. It's something that you still miss a little bit. It was rowdy, it was crazy, you know, we were rude and we, we intimidated the hell out of your op opponents. We sometimes were very harsh on our own team as well, you know. But that's part and parcel of being in a crowd of football, you know. It, it's, it's really enjoyable. Um, to be very honest, I don't think it's been like that since. That Malaysia Cup uh, is, is something you, you can't bring back. Uh. Sadly to say, you can't bring it back, even they are trying now. Because that time, you, today was Monday, Tuesday you're talking, you know what I mean? Uh? No handphone, no mobile, but you're calling, you know what I mean? You meet and you hey, Saturday, you know what I mean? You, as much as people are now waiting for your EPL, right? You know, when they didn't have it, that kind of, of anxiety, they're just waiting for. Since then, since 94, I've been to World Cup, I've been to um, Old Trafford and EPL and all that. You know, 
I, w- I would say that our atmosphere back in 94, you know, our crowd back in 94, uh, the experience you get in watching a football game then is, is no less than if you were a Man U fan or if you were in the World Cup supporting your country. It's just as, you know, it's just as passionate and exciting back then. Uh, um, I do miss that, you know. Part of me thinks that eventually we'll get there again. Why not, you know? The Football Association of Singapore is the oldest football association in Asia and the eighth oldest in the world, you know. Even older than FIFA. Way back in 1892, we inherited the game from the British while we were a colony and the beautiful game became our own. (laughs) Then we established the FAS. The Malaysia Cup was also a gift from our friends in the British Isles. The crew of the HMS Malaya donated one of two cups to be played for in Malayan tournament. And so, in 1921, the Malaya Cup began and is being played for even until today as the Malaysia Cup. Those were good times for football, man. People grew up with it and it was part of life for us. People would go down to the national stadium to cheer for the Lions in the 60s and 70s. You know, some of my father's friends were in the national team in those days. The golden years, the years just after independence, the years of nationhood and nation building, where we were still proud to be on our own and going strong, where we were building our HDB flats high into the sky, where we began sending our young men to defend our country. Oh, you know, we lifted the Malaysia Cup 24 times and we won it in 1994, which was just two seasons after we had been relegated to Division 2. But 1994 was the last time that we held that cup in our hands, and will probably be the last time that we ever will hold that trophy as a nation. We said goodbye to the Malaysia Cup tournament after that because we wanted to develop the national team better by focusing on our own local league, and we launched the S League nine months later. And then, the national stadium was empty more and more often, even during international matches. Well, people still turn up for things like the Tiger Cup Finals, which we won in 1998 and 2005. But they didn't want to waste their time watching a semi-final or some Kuching Kurap group stage match. So the stadium would be empty, except for a small bunch of us. And the benches, and the lights, and the grass would watch the game. The stadium, she would watch the game with us. But now, she's gone as well. Some people say it's because the EPL is more interesting, so nobody watches local football. Some people say it's because we don't play against our traditional rivals Malaysia anymore. But I think it's it's something else that's changed. The game is the same, but the people And what about the stadium? When she thinks about football, she wonders about what happens at the National Day Parade and she asks whether people are there for the nation or for the spectacle of a nation. Who wanted us to pull out a Malaysia Cup? Nobody did, you know. But they felt that it was the right thing to do at that point in time. We spent one year in 1995 in limbo, out of Malaysia Cup. Mm-hmm. Don't have any real professional league. We don't know the reasons behind it. There could have been many reasons. We can speculate, oh, you know, the Malaysians were arrogant, or they called us Geelong, whatever, you know. Or simply for the fact that maybe we just felt that it was time. We had a league to call our own, rather than being dependent on the grace of the Malaysians. At that point in time, we needed to find a viable alternative to the Malaysia Cup. Whilst it was a successful tournament for us, 
it was also a bane to our domestic and international football. Because of our preoccupation with the Malaysia Cup, we in those days had no time to upgrade the youth development. Uh, there was very little that was done with our domestic Premier League. So everybody was more focused on watching the Malaysia Cup. Okay. So our international football, our domestic football suffered. If you want a successful national team, you must have a very strong youth development program. Over the last uh, four or five years, uh, from 2000 onwards, a lot of effort has been put into youth development. Uh, clubs that have started their centres of excellence with help from the Football Association of Singapore, funding-wise and also technical uh, support-wise. The National Association, FAS, has also started the National Football Academy. Now, being an elite national player of young boys of 15 years old, they have uh, so many things to look for. They are being paid now for daily allowance, they have food, they have uh, medical screening, they have tuition, they have bursaries, all are in place for them. Again, these are players who should be moving up to the national team and of course filling up the places in the S-League uh, to, to provide excitement to our fans when they play in the S-League. So I, I, I think we have the players coming through. Uh, the conveyor belt is producing the players for, for Singapore in the future. The strength of the national team, whether it's under 23 or national team, very much depends on the product that you are churning out from your own professional league. You cannot on the one hand and one breath say, I support Singapore football and go only when there's a chance for the A team to win the Tiger Cup. And then the rest of the time they get trounced, you don't show up and show support. So, but is then I say there's some, there's some hypocrisy there. But along the way, if you look at it, the S-League, Standard had dropped. Players were not that forthcoming. Salaries were actually, instead of going up, were going down. I mean, I remember we used to pay some of the foreigners 8,000, 10,000 bucks a month. I mean, these days, I don't think the ethnic foreigners get anything more than 5,000, you know. So, in a way, if you look at it, instead of spiraling upwards, I mean, some things have gone down a bit. Attendances have dropped. You know, I mean, we used to get 10, 12,000 those days for ordinary Ashley games purely because of players, but I don't think you can get two, three thousand these days. How we are going to not get the fans to come back, I believe it's uh, the quality of football. If the quality improves, if the product improves, means the s -League. people will come and watch. Just like uh, now they have got so many things to choose from. No? EPL is a product to me, Liverpool is a product to me. Honestly, if you ask me, Liverpool is a product to me. because. I'm so far away from Liverpool, a few thousand miles away. I don't even know the people there. You know, why am I so crazy about Liverpool? Because there's a void in Singapore. You see, I'm also you know, at a loss of you know, uh, naming who the outstanding players are. I mean, Ahmad Latif, uh, to name a few. But I don't think that uh, they have that kind of charisma and personality that the players of the past had. And because of that, I think uh, fans are not coming out, you know, uh, by the thousands to come and support. I think we need to have more national games, more the national team playing more in Singapore, uh, with relatively strong opponents uh, to bring back that fervor. We we're not getting enough of the national team anymore. We only see it when the tournaments come and then they disappear. You know, I don't think the national team is uh, playing enough for Singaporeans to get that that feeling, that fervour. They were idols then because the fans saw them regularly playing international matches. They were playing Malaysia Cup regularly. So people began to identify. If there is a problem now, it is because our players are not playing regularly internationally. But our players are playing regularly in the S-League, which is a high level of competition. So people who come regularly to watch uh, S-League matches can identify with these players and idolise them. If they say local football allows me to channel my passion, you know, and I think we may not be as crazy, I may not be as crazy about Liverpool as I'm right now, because there's no more other channels. <laughs> Once I was watching football at the Kopitiam when my friend asked me, "Hey, why nowadays all the football on TV is from England one?" And he's right. I can't watch Singapore play unless I go to a stadium. 
Why like that? Is it because society is different now? Is it the newspapers and TV channels fault? Or is it because the players these days don't play with the same passion as before? My father taught me that when there is a problem, you should look at yourself first. Perhaps there is something I've done or something that I've forgotten to do. Everybody wants to watch a winning team. That's the trouble with Singaporeans. Everybody wants to watch a winning team. Even for our side, uh, Tampines. After we won the cup, now we're getting 3,000 plus spectators. Prior to that, we were getting about half, 1,005. You know, I mean, how you sell to its people just want to watch a winning team. If a team loses, well, they lose their enthusiasm, they lose their support, and then they start all kinds of uh, abuse Renting. on players, on referees, on everybody. You remember in 1992 when the team was performing very badly, we got re relegated that year. The, I tell you, we lost a lot of money. All right, there were less than 10, 15,000. Okay, there were those low. Those were the the the, the, the times when the, when 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 things seemed to have fallen apart. When Singapore under me lost the Malaysia Cup to Selangor back in 1978, right? I had a lot of abuse. My family were abused. Right? They make nuisance telephone calls in the odd hours of the morning. And uh, even my children were scolded. And uh, because they went into my family, and I was thinking, I as a volunteer, doing something for the country, and my children are now suffering. Wherever they went, they will always be criticized, you know. And so that made me uh, to call it a day. They want to associate themselves with winners. I was, I, let me tell you, if we did not win a Tiger Cup, we will not get the kind of support that we will get. We, we have, don't have time for losers, do we? Yeah, I think Singaporeans generally don't have time for losers. If you lose, off you go. Singapore is always a very competitive uh, you know, country. You know, Everybody uh, have that kiasu kind of, uh, you know, attitude where everybody wants to be the best, you know, and everybody wants to compete with each other and, and, and uh, outlast the, the others. I think to a certain extent, it's partly to do with a, an urbanised society. I mean, I grew up in a, in a small village and whenever I went to London, I was shocked by how, how seemingly rude people were, pushing each other out of the way, people using their horn a lot when they were driving, people seemingly getting very angry if they couldn't get to where they wanted to go. And um, So maybe it's a feature of a, you know, a fast-paced urban, urban life where people are, you know, people are competitive and people are eager to get ahead. We, we can't get away from this, you know. I mean, again, as a kind of post-immigrant commercial society, success is very, very important to Singaporeans, you know. I mean, you can't take away the success factor from most of the things that Singaporeans do. Somewhere in the seven, late 70s, early 80s, we were trying to be number one. That was part of the survival instinct, you know, and then the survival instinct left, went on to desperately wanting to be the best. Yeah, we were number world number one port, world number one airport and all that. And that kind of set in. When you do something well for decades, you know, everybody says, hey, don't rock the boat, this is fantastic, let's all jump on board. Just keep going, people know what they're talking about, we listen to the official voices because they've let us, you know, in a very successful, amazingly successful, a world famous kind of success story. So who wants to rock the boat? Who wants to be the first individual to say, I, you know, I think my family is going to be different, I'm going to raise my family different and my children are going to be different. They're going to contribute to society in a different kind of way. Who has the guts to, to be that first person? Kiasuism, unfortunately, it's, everybody has it inside, but to what, ex to what extent and to how extreme it is. Everybody wants the best for the kids, but not when you have to uh, rush for free textbooks, yeah. not when you have to budge and then uh, step on one another to get something that's free and stuff like that. Balloons or something like that. No, that's sad. That's sad. That's pathetic. These are the real achievements of a year of progress in which the people have shared as never before. On their stability 
and the government's sound administration, our commercial prosperity continues to grow. This great port of Singapore is our life, and the government is seeing that it works to the highest pitch of efficiency. There has been a mind shift, uh, in, and it is part and parcel of uh, affluence. Uh, society as a whole has come out. In the 70s, there was that much less of a successful track record of Singapore as a kind of global brand and a kind of, you know, a, a huge success story. And life was probably a lot simpler for everybody as well. And growing up in the 70s, I really felt that life was a lot simpler uh, than it's become. We have our roots uh, as a port city. And so from there, we've always existed as a, a city that thrives on commerce. As a society, we were fighting for ourselves. We were in that mode, you know, where we have to survive, we have to come together, and we have to grow. And so this chasing after money that you talk about is obviously a trade which uh, many Singaporeans hold dear. You know, it's still evident that we have this kind of um, uh, post-immigrant society mentality. I think so. I mean, it's all about money. And where does that come from? It comes from immigrant thrift, immigrant mentalities, you know. You send the, the, the father to come here, and he's got, or the young man who comes here, and they're just working, and they've got no time for play, and they're saving their money for something, you know, that's always deferred, something that's, you know, in the future. And they don't even know what it is, really. When they get there, it's something that's a bit of a disappointment. You know, if everybody is focused on making money, um, and with the dynamism that, you know, these kind of mindsets uh, create, uh, then maybe there's not enough uh, attention given to, you know, thinking about other things, how to improve, for instance, the, you know, the, the culture of the city, you know, uh, uh, progress in other things, how to help, for instance, uh, people who are downtrodden. That's how it has shifted and as the mindset has shifted from a, a little bit more relaxed, uh, slightly poorer society to a richer, more competitive, more demanding society, the interest in soccer and uh, the, the, the kind of interest in soccer has also shifted. And I think soccer in that sense, the changing fortunes of soccer, the changing face of soccer has, is reflective of the changing face of our society here. Nowadays when you talk about football promotion, you have to look at the nature and the way we organize it as a business proposition. Okay? It is no more just getting 22 people together, just organize some amateurish you know, schemes and competition and that's it. It's unavoidable that uh, in uh, today's footballer um, do play for money because we are talking about professional sports here and when you talk about professional sport, you're talking about livelihood and you need, you know, money to, to feed the kids at home, to feed the wife, you know, stuff like that. You know, obviously the money is the motivation, you know. So I think it makes a lot of difference. I mean, in Singapore, I think unfortunately the emphasis is on paper. You know, I think there's no two ways about it. In today's society, it's different. People, are, people have a, a, a diploma, people have a, a qualification, you know, and they, they, they are very well protected. I talked to some of the national players of my generation and some of them are telling me off the record, you know, I don't think I want my son to go too much into sports because look at me and look at you, yeah? You go and get a degree and you get a job and you're paid well, and you can survive, yeah? I star for a short while. After that, I've got nothing now, you know? I'm struggling to make ends meet. I mean, I wouldn't name the footballers, but there are some footballers who are really in trouble now, you know? And when you see these kind of things happening as a parent, you also think two, three times before you decide whether you want your child to go down that road and take that gamble. There's a lot of uh, graduates, so sometimes they also want to be in our shoe. Huh? On that particular time, uh, maybe they are a bit unlucky, they are good in their papers, but they're not so good in soccer. But uh, talking about long term wise, they are much ahead than us. Uh, because papers is count better than what you have. Uh, because soccer after reach 30 or early 30s, uh, I think some of the clubs will thank you brother, all the best. <laughs> 
For our children, it's easier. Today, they're growing up with no barriers between them. A radically new education policy gives equal attention to all four language streams and aims at fusing them into an integrated system with the same syllabus and textbooks. Along the way, education changed. Competition in the education system became uh, far more. Ranking introduced a real peer, pre peer pressure in schools, real uh, competition, you know. And so mindsets of parents shifted from entertainment to education. And there is a lot of pressure. It has just grown, I think, more and more. We have to be realistic, all right? Most Singaporeans have got other priorities for their children. I think it's because of that, that a lot of parents are not allowing their children to spend too much time on, on sports, even for leisure, because, you know, you've got to get straight A's, you've got to get, you know, that particular aggregate. We send you for tuition here, for tuition there, and where is the poor child going to have his time to practice? Sometimes we have no choice to send the kids to tuition because we as parents, we can't help them because we don't know what in the world is happening? We, we just can't solve that particular maths problem. So we have no choice but to send them to tuition. Why? Because the standard is so high. Nowadays, it's too much pressure on the child. 80% the parents grumbling, crying, mothers. You know, they want 92%. So this, I think, will probably add to the anxiety of parents. And uh, with this anxiety, there's additional stress on a poor child so to excel more and more so yeah. that's the way it is it's happening you can't help it you grow up into it singapore culture what do you mean that do, do, do they no i mean like okay they start primary as i said very keen then if you education system uh, education it's, it's the system and if you are out of the system it's not that you can't get a job but every mother especially wants the child to be, be a doctor. doctors and lawyers and you know you know what i mean Maybe O-level, A-level are impediments because a lot of top young school champions give up by the time they go to O and A-levels. We understand that. I think all of us, sports administrators, we feel it. We need to bring some emphasis back to schools and the inter-school competitions and all. Some top established schools, like, well, without mentioning names, right, have stopped football altogether. Well, the kid football, isn't it? Yeah? Right at the age of 13, an aspiring footballer has no chance. No chance. It's the dream of every boy in school to want to represent the school. And what, what more in a team game like football, you know? So don't, don't deprive them of that opportunity. You look at all the digressions and all the alternatives a kid has today. Yeah? He has to study, he has a computer, so he's not much time for football. Yeah? How much time he's got on the field? Next question, where is the field? Eh? I mean, schools don't, 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 uh, don't want them to play football, they want to keep the grass, or whatever it may be. But, you know, I mean, schools like RI, SGI, you can imagine they don't have a football team, yeah? St. Andrews, I mean, it's, it's crazy. The parents' emphasis on them doing well in their exams, I mean, as a coach, we have to respect that. Every father, mother and son uh, wants their sons to do well in school. I think we have to balance between books and boots. So they know when to put on their boots, they know when to put on their books. Everybody is so driven to get good grades that they forget about the moral side of the child, you know. Some kids are so good at studies, but when it comes to socialising, they're just zero. You know, when they meet somebody, you have to, the parents have to say, come on, say hello, come on, say hello. You know, and I think that's very sad and very lacking. And, you know, we hope we are doing a good job in trying to balance the two because we try to teach them um, as much social skills as we can besides just being, having their heads stuck in the book all day long. The spirit with which you grow in the field and the lessons you learn there can be far more valuable than what you are trying to teach in the classroom or in the bedroom with your child, in his study room and all. I play my son's football every Saturday. Yeah, we go to the West Coast, all the cousins and all come, we have about a 10 a side at the West Coast. And in that game itself, I see all the different nephews and nieces and my sons all growing up, you know, and how I see the personalities come out. The personalities that they try to keep under wraps when they are with you because they want to show the respect and all. But on the field, 
they become themselves and you see a lot of uh, your child no? and the child sees a lot of himself because after that when you sit down and say you know just now when you shouted or when you missed the goal and you blamed it on somebody else and you know there's a lesson to be learned here you know something about yourself maybe and that helps so I think as a society uh, we will do well if we can make sports and the sporting way of life uh, part and parcel of our culture here. But it takes a certain kind of willfulness about it. And by this, I don't mean you know, the, 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 the kind of taking fun seriously kind of thing or, or institutionalizing fun. What I really mean is the, the willingness to take certain kind of choices, really. To let go, to uh, refuse to dictate your children's choices of, you know, of careers and, and what they study in school to say, hey, it's fine, study music, you know, um, study art, this is good for us, good for the mix, you know, we'll always have enough lawyers, don't worry about it, people want to become lawyers, you know, don't worry about it, we'll always have enough doctors, you know, but hey, if you want to become a professional sportsman, go for it. Look, we have already got a sports school, for instance, uh, I think that is, that's very important. Um, and with that kind of option, uh, maybe uh, in terms of uh, professional sports, you know, the, there is that, that connection. And not just being in sports, but being in sports related kinds of things. So it's not, it's not just you must be a sports person all your life, but you could be a coach, you know, you, you could go into physiotherapy and so on and so forth. And I think it's, it's really, you know, having those kinds of options. Uh, that's important, definitely. I, I think it's a risk that uh, most Singaporeans will not take because um, sports is a very short-term career and uh, I don't think it, the sportsmen in Singapore are paid as well as those in overseas. So in other words, um, there's no, why should, why should they take such a risk whereby they have a comfortable, uh, normal 9 to 5 kind of job. Everybody is just, I think, waiting, uh, wait and see kind of attitude adopting this attitude to see whether, you know, what they're going to produce. At the end of the day, the bottom line is, uh, hey, if you made it, how much endorsements are you going to get? You know, if you go pro, are you going to get 10 mil like Michelle Wei or something like that? Yeah. Is it going to be enough to put food on the table? That's the yeah. thing. It's always, that's always the big question, right? You want to try and be professional about football. In other words, you have to try to tell people that, you know, if you can't study or you, you, you think that you, you can study and still play football and make more money out of it, okay, make football a career. But at the rate you are closing down local clubs in the S League, you're not sending the right signal to the parents, to the young ones. What's the point of playing football? Only eight local clubs. Eight local clubs, 30 in your squad, how many total? 240? Is that all your reservoir? So, if Singapore's population can only hold 240 professional players, that's quite a crying shame, isn't it? I'm a professional player in my local club, and we have a professional player from overseas, from Korea, from Australia, from England. They, and they were telling me that uh, they have uh, it's strange to come to a country where the papers only talk about, you know, overseas league. In the sports page of four pages, you get three pages of football, but 90% of uh, European and EPL football. So where's Singapore left? You know, I mean, we just so and so beat so and so, uh, and that's the score. Yeah. You know, they find it very uh, strange that why is this happening? They were saying that when there's this Japanese player who was telling me that. You know, in, in Japan, front page, all Japanese sports. Any, anything, any, anything that's foreigner, you it's realize, always. it's always secondary. All he said was, uh, local, local newspaper, all about EPL, Spanish League. Nothing about the local football. Then, then, then he, sh he shook his head, he said, uh, is this good for is this good for Singapore? Then then I I I just I just I just don't know what to say. The role of the newspapers was so important at that time to bring in the crowds, you see. Now with EPL the people can easily say that the EPL football is better than your S League football, you know? 
So, and, 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 and no matter what sort of previews you do for the S League, and no matter how, how big uh, hype you create out of it, you know, people can already see the difference, you know. So they, they, they're not going to sort of go there. They have not been loyal to the <laughs> country. You know, the press, what to do? Or they, you know, uh, for them, it's a bread and butter situation. To me, it is something that the press have to explain. Why are they not putting in resources to, to, you know, to report on our local, you know, Premier League? No? Yeah, they have to explain whether you know these people are not cooperating. You know, when they interview them, they are not cooperating, or very hard to get them, or they just don't want to commit any resources for this kind of you know report. See, but they must understand that they have a role to play, la. It's a national project, and I think it's worth you know, putting some effort to help, you know, us boost up the uh, game, you know. A newspaper, let's not forget that at the end of the day, it's really about selling newspaper. Um, I, I, would, I would argue the fact that we actually affect the local fan base. I would say it's more the local fan base affecting us. You know, when we were in the Malaysia Cup, you would see very extensive coverage in the Malaysia Cup because, you know, you have a lot of interest in the Malaysia Cup. 95, 96 came along and S-League was the only local football we had. We had, didn't have much of a national team. Um, the paper reacts to what the readers want, you know, and I guess that um, we had a league that the people weren't particularly interested in. A newspaper is also a product, it's like, a, it's like your toothpaste or your shaver, you see. So, I mean, they are selling a product. If they, they realise, they've conducted so many surveys, street level surveys and found out that people want EPL. While emphasizing on this, space gets limited. Something else gotta give. So I think in that in that sense the slick suffers. I mean the new paper for which I work now, it has all along had a history of covering a lot of soccer. We were the number one football paper so to speak, you know, and you read our pages, it's all about football, 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 you know, whether it's local football, British football. I mean we were about football. Today you have golf. A lot of golf. <laughs> If you seriously look at S League, I mean, between 2,000 people taking the trouble to go and watch a game and getting a worldwide audience watching the EPL, I mean, where do you think the emphasis should be? You know, I'm not saying that you should completely ignore the S League, but I think the emphasis should be on what's being seen by a lot of people, what is being talked about uh, for the players who are coming through, for the icons in, in that particular sport. Maybe the, the local sports should try and bring themselves also one rung higher too, you see, and, 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 and compete for, for that kind of, of news. The only thing is that maybe Singapore sports doesn't have uh, as many heroes as previously because now people can hero worship on TV. You know, there's, there's Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, all to see who wants to see, uh, you know, no alam shah. <laughs> but somewhere in the mid 90s or early 90s, football became life. Uh, almost every, slowly but surely, almost every day you get a football match live on TV, you know. And if you look at the current situation now, it's a true reflection of what has happened. You get uh, three, four games live on Saturday from EPL alone. Then you don't want to sleep the night, you go and watch your Spanish league, you watch your Italian, uh, I mean Syria now not so, but there used to be Italian league. And then in the weekday, if there's not another EPL game, you have your Champions League. And that becomes a real entertainment show, you know, which uh, every football aficionado would really uh, rally, you know, to around, you know, and watch with great thrill and excitement. So it's very, very popular. The Singapore people now, I mean, they say, oh, my team is better than your team. My team means Arsenal, your team is Newcastle. You know, that sort of allegiance uh, is now attached to EPL and not Singapore. So this kind of field uh, kind of took over the vacuum when we pulled out of Malaysia Cup. And uh, Malaysia Cup games used to go live to the homes also. So there was that, that excitement then. I think that kind of took over and somehow Singaporeans just now prefer faster, higher standard of football than watching the national team or local league. La. These are teams that are successful on in an international uh, arena. And 
being associated with those teams makes you feel much more successful. The, those teams come and they tour Thailand, they tour Singapore, they tour Japan, and they beat the national teams of, of those countries. You know, five nil, seven one, eight one, that sort of thing. And you know, who would you rather support? Would you rather say, "Hey, I'm a Lions fan," or "Hey, I'm a Man U fan"? You know, and Man U just kicked the Lions, but you know, eight one. I remember when Man U came here. Basically, everyone was supporting for Man U and not for Singapore. You know, and some of the girls were shrieking Beckham's name and all that kind of stuff. Beckham wasn't playing, ironically, uh, but uh, everyone was cheering for Man U, Man U, Man U, Man U. Poor Singapore players were feeling like, oh my God, the whole stadium is against me. I think we've let them go haywire. You know, the past say five years huh? or eight years. The EPL has just rushed in, swiped this part of Asia. In terms of the the global brand, the global reach, yeah, uh, the merchandise. Wherever you go, you will see people wear uh, Man U jerseys. Yeah, you won't see many people outside of Singapore wear Lions jerseys. So I have to, I hate to say it, but I think yeah, um, part of the, the attraction of the EPL is just that kind of larger international success, international pool, international impact. Look at them paying $50, $60 for a child's uh, Manchester jersey made in China or Hong Kong or something like that. And they're buying. You, you know the labels. And you, you walk along the street uh, in the estates, and guys are wearing Newcastle uh, or, or, you know, Spurs. Shirts, Arsenal and Chelsea and Liverpool. And just across the road, there is a Liverpool fans club. Right? What business, you know, should uh, Liverpool and Manchester fans club here, thousands of miles away? You, you know, when they have. You can't fight EPL. Okay, I mean the standards all over Asia has dropped. Not only Singapore. I think Thailand don't have a proper league. Malaysia, as I said, has dropped. I don't think Vietnam, they've been fighting with each other. There's a new, the whole new council there. Uh, the league in China is not doing well. Apart from Korea and Japan, uh, Indonesia uh, is not positive too. EPL has overwhelmed them. You know, their enthusiasm, their interest, fully absorbed. You know, they really eroded the thing and they, you know, crept into the lives of the Singapore football fans. Almost now, total domination, you know. We had stars, you know. People like Dola Kasim, Kim Song, uh, Mamad No. You know, they were great football players, you know. Skillful, entertaining. Those breeds are real footballers. They have got real passion in their blood. When they play, they go all out and play to win. I was in the changing room sometimes. Like you see, they take the boot, they fling it. You know what I mean? So the passion that they lost, they lost. Nowadays, lose, they come out smiling, wait for the girlfriend, they go. <laughs> in those days, it's different. When the team loses, they will cry after the game in the dressing room. The coach uh, come to us, he will try to lift our spirits and say, okay, the game is lost. These are some of the mistakes we made. Try to avoid it and let's move on. So a good coach is one that is able to get you out of that situation fast and prepare for the next game. Like uh, our famous Chu Seng Kui, perhaps technically he's, he's very strong. But I think one of his strongest factors is that he knows how to motivate the team. He can stand in front of uh, the uh, national flag every morning when they raise the flag and cry and stand in the rain and to get gangrene on his, uh, on, on, on his foot and he still stand in the rain and he make all the players sing Majula Singapura without fail. When he gave you the shirt, I was assisting him. He's a very great coach. And let's say Kim Song one day just left his t-shirt and went to the toilet. He came back, he said, you take out your boots and not playing. So Kim Song went. That is your uh, national, you know that time we had our crest here, he said you have respect for that. If those days you talk about Malaysia Cup, yes, we are paid handsomely. <laughs> but our passion will not go off. That's rest assured. Yeah. To play against any team in Malaysia, 
to fight with any foreign team, regardless home or away, our passion is there. The older generation that time and the players, they have more passion and they love the sport. They give everything for the country, they play for the country and everybody is fighting just to play for Singapore. So if we have that kind of mentality, every player wants to work hard to prove I want to go to the national team, to play well for the national team, to play for my country. The fans start coming back. If you can fill up the national stadium, I'm sure that you can fill up the S-League stadium. No two ways about it. So I think the desire is gone, the passion is gone. They just content to play as league, go back home. Okay, I give bit contract enough. Because maybe time changes, the thinking changes. They only think about what I can get, but they forgot. Football career is short, so they must think all, not only about the money. Because here you must put in here, from here you bring yourself up, and you want to go, you want to work. Because I cite one example to. Two years ago, I told one player, he's an S-League player, quite, he's a national player, I don't have to mention him. I told him, I came back from Thailand. Every player wants to play for the country. Because why? They are poor. To play for the country, they become somebody. To play for a country, for them, to, they are somebody, man. They can buy a house, they can buy a car, and they become very popular, like actor, you know, in their country. I see here, you're just contented to come for training two hours every day and then you go back finish. Enough? I told the players, enough? If you think it's enough, I say you better look for a job. I tell you, you better look for other job. Don't play football. In two years' time, you're finished. If they love the sport, they must have that passion. First thing they know, without the ability they're talking about money, I think it's wrong. And I always stress to the players, to the club officials, we have to be professional in every aspect. You have to improve your game. The fitness level has to go up. That's why we imposed uh, the fitness level criteria. It's, it's a sad thing to do, but some players just uh, do not bother you know, about the fitness level. If you have the desire, if you have the passion, if you think training evening to your time, morning you do your own running, you do your own gym, you maybe do swimming, maybe you rest. Okay, you go out for a movie. Okay, you go out for shopping. You know, you take care of yourself. But you don't have the passion, you don't have the desire, you just contented to play. Okay, tonight I go out, I sleep for, okay, I enjoy, I go out, I don't care, I eat, I drink. I don't take care of everything. Then, I think the current attitude of most of the players, if I'm sad to say, is uh, I just get enough for myself, that's it. You know, I don't think the driving force, the, the, the motivation to really do well, I mean, you pay them three, four thousand, they're quite happy, you know. I mean, you look at what happened last week, three of the players missed a flight. I mean, it's a ridiculous situation for a team, you know. I mean, I think they should be taken to task, whatever the excuse, you know. So what, what does that show then? You know, I, I, I mean, there's discipline involved in sport, you know. I don't think they have the discipline. Uh, they don't really care, you know, some of them. Some really want to play, some, I mean, the team, I'm happy. But the current national team, I think there's something wrong with them. Definitely something wrong. And I think, I think in, in sport, if you don't have the passion, you don't have the motivation, you don't have the drive, then you're not going to achieve what you want to do. The players in the athletic only give up to so much. They don't aim higher than that. They do not want to play in the Malaysia Cup, or in the Korean League, or in the Indonesia League, or try going playing up. They are very settled and happy with what they have. And I think that's very wrong. They don't want to achieve further. They are comfortable. Too comfortable, become lazy. That is very bad. So I urge them, this is a challenge, go out. Go out, stand up and play. If you got a chance, go out. Don't worry about the money. When you are good, people will pay you. So don't afraid to expose yourself to other countries, playing against other teams. Some of them like to play in a group. They don't like to move because they don't like challenges, because maybe they don't have confidence. So I tell them now, you should put that aside. Aim high. Be believe in yourself. You don't believe in yourself, you can't play. Because if you don't have individual discipline, you can't play. So I think motivational factor, they have to build in them. 
sports can bring people together, irregardless of who they are, what our background, it's important that they smile, they're happy, they enjoy. At the end of the game, they came out and then smile, they laugh, you know. You can see who it can be, who next to them, Chinese, Malay or whatever, they hug each other and they chant together. That's the best part. And they sing ole, ole, ole. The same sound, same rhythm. And they do the wave. Can you imagine 55,000 doing the same thing together? And it's, it's, it's something you cannot bring back the memories. Huh? The days at what, 1994, when we picked up the Malaysia League and Cup double, that was something I mean to, to shout about. Yeah. Since then, we were, we were maintaining or we were you know, going on the decline. People obviously were looking forward for victories, this and that. But then during that patch, we would hardly have any wins, this and that. So fans started to, in fact, try to forget about Singapore football, in fact. It, uh, it was a wonderful feeling playing at National Stadium and I, I can see how now the passion has gone. There are a lot of die-hard fans, you know, they will support their teams through one year, two bad years, you know, five bad years, they're still die -hard. they got the merchandise, they got the, the uniforms, they go to the games faithfully. Singapore, you know, uh, uh, it comes back to success again. Singapore fans uh, need to, to support a successful team. When you want your team to win and you go and support them in, in the stadium, you become the, the 12th man for the team, you know, you really, uh, your winning desire get translated to the players on the pitch then they become, they want to win for you. The 50,000 fans will show up and support them as well. So the fans play a part. If they don't come, they are not passionate. We play also, some of them, we don't blame Alama. No passion, you know, no thrill. No atmosphere for me, important in the stadium when you play is atmosphere between the fans and the players. Because when the fans are there, the players get, get boosted in the moral, moral will go up. Because hey, they're cheering us, even when we're down. It would be totally different if it's like packed, fully packed, and rather than uh, like an empty stadium. It's like, it's like motivation for players at the same time to do well. In fact, if you want the sportsmen to really do well, they need this kind of motivation. They need fans. In fact, without fans, there's no football in Singapore. And you know, once you become critical of something far too often, you tend to lose touch with it. Like you tend to give up on it because you find that it's not meeting your expectations. It is not meeting your standards. Then I think the standards for success were lower. The competition was lower. The uh, standards for what would be defined as success were a bit lower. And so people were just happy to go to the stadium and shout their hearts out. Yeah, I think as a society, in, uh, as a whole, um, we become more affluent as well. And with affluence, you, you begin to be more reserved in your behaviour, at least publicly. Maybe privately you're still the same, but publicly you may not show so much emotion as before. I don't know, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. You may be right. Maybe we, we have changed to a passionless lot, I don't know. Some fans really passionate, even the new generation, some of them. But if you see properly that how many people turn up at the national stadium to watch Singapore play, how many, I don't know how much. Five, 5,000, 10,000. So if they come in full force, uh, they should come whether we are playing. When you talk about national team in other countries, when a country, the team is playing, always you can see 30, 40, 50,000. But here now, it's very difficult. Even friendly game, free, so people don't come. So I think the passion has gone. Not all. But generally, the new generation must try to get hooked on football like the Tiger Cup final. That was fun, but that was one of those things because we were doing well. But we need them more when we are down. Even if you don't support, don't condemn the S League. Okay, that, now that's important. And if we do mount an, a national effort to participate, whether it's under 23, whether it's national teams, and we have put in a lot of efforts, Players and coaches have put in a lot of Of course, if, if you don't put in efforts, don't come near us. Shoot us. Okay. Put in a lot of efforts, put in a lot of resources. And at, at the end of the day, they are your sons and daughters. You know, I'm talking about the national women's team as well, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay? Give them the support. Mm -hmm. You know, we are saying that. Okay. 
And I think that will come along, as you can see from the Tiger Cup finals. Many do come and support, not because we were winning that night. <laughs> well, of course, we, we carried to the National Stadium a 3-1 advantage. And that probably encouraged a lot of people to say, hey, no loose situation, let's all come. <laughs> we came here, we won, we won mine, and that's to win the Tiger Cup. Whatever it takes to run to our last drop, blood, last drop of sweat, we do it. And we did it. We found our own pants. We won the Tiger Cup and became the kings of Southeast Asia. The stadium was full for just one more night and people were cheering and screaming and waving their flags. Proud of the team, proud of Singapore football. I wanted to hug everyone around me. I wanted to kiss the whole team. I wanted to drive around my estate, pressing my horn and screaming the news. I wanted to put the boys on an open-top bus and parade them to the middle of the city so that everyone could congratulate them. play a very important role in football, definitely. You will sing when you win. Yeah. You will hammer you when you lose. Yeah. You will but if you start winning, the fans will come. It's normal and it's very natural. Was I the only one who thought this would be a fitting celebration for our heroes? So now I know why there are no heroes in this country. We have cast them all away. We have betrayed them. I think no, no doubt today, today Singapore fans uh, have more choices. I think nothing beats, you know, coming to a stadium to support the national team. I think this is something that is truly ours. It's truly uh, uh, something that we can call our, our own. And 
I, I, I really hope that they do give a chance to to sing the to, to the ethnic because without without the fans, you know, sponsor won't be coming in, and if there's no sponsor, it will be difficult for players to make a living out of it. And I hope they are. They will stick through the team, through uh, you know, through the good times and the bad times, because it's during the bad times that we need fans like you to to come down and give us extra push, not just the good times. I'm sure. I mean, of course, good times. Everybody wants to support you, but I think it's during the bad times that we need you more, because. Um, because I remember during the Tiger Cup 2002, you know, fans start to started to desert the team because we lost 4-0 to the Malaysia team. So that period of time, I was quite um, depressed that Singaporean fans are so fickle-minded because they only turn up when the team is doing well, you know. And they only want to associate with winners, and that's not passion. That's what I call kiasu. And we should get rid of we should get rid of that because we should stick by what we believe and uh, through the good and, and, and the bad. So, this is what we've become. The fishing village that learned to play the numbers game. And we got very good at it. We've built up a mighty economy, homes for everyone, and lots of jobs. Some people even have two jobs. Pragmatic, dispassionate. If it doesn't make money, we don't care. If it's not successful, we won't support it. Yeah, that's who we are. Is that who I am? Does money get in the way of my relationships? Does practicality arrest my passion? Maybe I have let my world get the better of me. So my friend, we have reached an important junction on our journey. You want to turn right or go straight? Climb into the top Where only the strong survive each step we take, it's getting harder, but we'll go on, cause we've been there before, knowing you're by our side, we'll go far and beyond, get a car, I'm gone, from shore. Take you back home.